All right, I think we can get started now. Um, thank you so much to everyone who is here. I'm really excited to talk to our panelists. My name is Grace. I'm the communications director at MMN and I'll be moderating this panel. Um, we have Hannah Judson, Luke Heron, and Dr. Delman Coates, um, who will be who will be talking about um, loan forgiveness and debt forgiveness and what that means and connecting it to the broader world of MMT. And so first up, we have Hannah Judson, who is presenting. Um, Hannah has been executive director of the Modern Money Network for the last 18 months alongside Ashley Burke. Um, they are a third year third year doctoral student in sociology at State University of New York, Stony Brook, and their research focuses on the racial wealth gap and intergenerational wealth transfer broadly. All right, Hannah, you can go ahead and take it away. I want to go ahead and just introduce everyone really quickly, and then I am more than happy to pull up my slides. Yeah, I can introduce everyone. Um, we also have Dr. Delman Coates. Dr. Delman Coates is the founder of the Our Money Campaign, an economic justice campaign launched in May 2019. He is founder of the Black Church Center for Justice and Equality. And since February 2004, Dr. Coates has served as the senior pastor of Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland. And we also have Luke Heron, who is a PhD candidate in law at Yale University and formerly the managing editor of the Law and Political Economy blog. Um, his research focuses primarily on the law and political economy of consumption, consumer markets, and household finance, and his work has cleared legal obstacles to mass de debt cancellation, first for students of predatory colleges, and now for student debtors more broadly. And I'm sure a lot of people saw um, an announcement about student debt came from the Biden administration today, and so this is a really timely panel, um, and I'm excited to hear everyone's thoughts on it. Um, so Hannah, you can go ahead and take us away. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Very excited to be here. Super excited to present um, a brief, brief overview of some of the research that I've been doing in the last couple of months. Um, let me make sure that I can get my slides pulled up. Is everyone able to see that? Awesome. Okay. Sweet. So, um, yeah, as Grace mentioned, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to post them in the chat. I'm more than happy to answer um, at the end. But um, as Grace said, I'm Hannah, a student at Stony Brook, um, and I'm focused, my research is focused primarily around the racial wealth gap and in particular the ways in which student loan debt uh, and homeownership into intergenerational wealth transfer and its impact on the racial wealth gap. So briefly, um, I'm going to take us through a little bit of context, talk about some of my key findings from the most recent uh, round of math that I've done, and then talk about what the implications are for that more broadly. So um, to start off with, uh, Hannah, real quick, your slides are still loading. Oh. Is anyone else having a thing? Um, yeah, it just looks like it looks like it's pending. Like there's three yeah. dots. Hannah, if you send them to me, um, you can go ahead and get started, and maybe I can try sharing them. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'll post it in here. Absolutely. I can also potentially. Oh, I'm sorry, Sherry. I'm not sure what that's about. I wonder if um, that's so weird because everything was fine earlier. Well, in that case, um, maybe Dr. Coates could go and then Hannah, we could get your slides loaded if that works for everybody. Cool. Sounds good to me. Well. I'm good. 
Perfect. All right. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really delighted to be a part of today's conversation on behalf of the Our Money campaign. Um, it's great to be here with uh, other allies and uh, folks around the country who are endeavoring to make our economy and our society more just. Uh, so the topic that I've been given is how to mainstream core insights of MMT and how it relates to building public support for debt forgiveness. And I want to say a few things as well as a faith leader, provide a brief summary of the religious case for debt forgiveness. This has really been important to me uh, as a faith leader, as a historian of religion, to sort of bring to the conversation of developing of economic justice um, a kind of lens that faith leaders um, might adopt um, as a means towards developing a moral economy. And so, you know, the, as I see it, the problem of student debt is a part of a larger problem of household debt in our society. And as a pastor of a predominantly black and Latino in a predominantly black and Latino community, you know, I've witnessed firsthand the ways in which debt in general wreaks havoc on the lives of average ordinary Americans just struggling to, to survive. Just some um, brief stats on the state of household debt. Average household debt is steadily increasing in America. Um, household debt in the form of mortgages, home equity lines of credit, credit card balances, uh, auto loans and student loans is almost $16 trillion. Um, student loan debt in particular is right around 1.7 trillion. And just last week, Republican lawmakers at the same time introduced what they called the Student Loan Accountability Act, which would prohibit mass student loan forgiveness. And so we all know that Americans right now are awash in household debt in general and student loan debt in particular. I say often in my presentations that the average American is literally working 40 to 50 hours a week to pay interest on borrowed money. And so if we're to address this issue at a systemic level, we must shift our reliance on money created through bank lending to money created through public spending. I want to share with folks, they can go to our website for the Our Money campaign. Our website is OurMoneyUS.org. You can see information about our policy proposals and recommendations information about our advisory council and a whole host of articles, educational resources that we have on the Our Money campaign website. That's OurMoneyUS.org. Now, what many people fail to realize is that most of what we think of and use as money in our society is created by banks when they make what we call loans. Um, there are a whole host of public policy solutions that would create mission-oriented um, uh, mission oriented spending for our economy in ways that would make the American people less reliant on borrowing and lending. And the black community in particular, we're constantly sold a vision of economic empowerment that is against our best interests. Um, you know, and, and, and as it relates to this topic of debt in general and student loan debt in particular, there are a whole host of financial predators promoting expanding access to credit as a means of uh, economic development in underrepresented communities. It's something that I hear all the time, that we need to expand access to credit in black and brown communities. And what I often say is that what, what poor minority communities need is not just, not just more access to lending. We need more access to public spending. And right now, there are a series of myths about the fiscal policy capacity of the federal government to spend on public priorities, as well as there are a series of budget rules, the PAYGO rule on the House side and the BIRD rule on the Senate side that we're really interested in educating advocates and the public um, about these rules that constrain the policy imagination of policymakers when it comes to spending on public priorities. Interestingly enough, these budget rules oftentimes just come into play on policies that would benefit the American people. Um, but war, bailouts, things of this nature, for some reason, these budget rules kind of go out the window. We've seen that and we see that all the time. Um, 
we do not see the kind of robust commitment to shifting um, to uh, to for supporting public policies um, 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 that would benefit the American people around guaranteed jobs, health care, affordable housing, a Green New Deal, um, more investments uh, in spending on public education. When these kind of issues come up, we're often told that for some way the federal government is broke. And, and this is why MMT is so critical and important. That our money campaign is really designed to mainstream these core insights with faith leaders, civil rights leaders. And I think uh, we've had a, a, a lot of success in educating faith leaders and civil rights leaders right now to understand the core tenets, the core insights of MMT. I conduct trainings and have been conducting trainings for the last two years. And we're in the process of getting them on board with supporting specific policy proposals, a public policy agenda that will enable us to, to rethink our, our reliance on money created through lending so that we can um, uh, prioritize policies um, that would shift our reliance on money created through public spending. Now, every time I do our presentations, people ask if the federal government has this enormous uh, money creation power, this enormous capacity to spend on public priorities, why, do, why don't we do it? And I often say that it's because the financial sector benefits when the federal government underutilizes its public spending capacity. Whenever the federal government underutilizes its capacity to spend on public priorities, it then forces households, businesses, local and state governments to borrow um, and to go into debt. Um, in December, of, uh, on December, as of December 29th, state and local governments issued $302.3 billion of debt in the form of bonds for public priorities, the most we've seen in at least a decade. And so our campaign, the Our Money campaign, is calling for full cancellation of student loan debt and for a transformation in the way in which we do fiscal policy, one that harnesses uh, the full capacity of the federal government to spend on public priorities. We think that, we, and we believe that this would bring about a paradigm shift, a necessary paradigm shift in America. Um, too many Americans um, are saddled with debt this burden of debt and are at a time when they need to be preparing themselves to be productive members of society. And this is something that many European countries managed to do without having the monetary sovereignty that we have in the United States of America. But the U.S. and the U.S. itself um, used to offer near free college tuition. Some of you may recall Dr. Stephanie Kelton's report in 2018 on student debt cancellation, which found that such a policy of full cancellation of student loan debt will have a minimal effect on inflation. We're all, we're all, our call for student debt cancellation is in response to what we hope will prove to be a temporary situation wherein college education has become a exorbitantly expensive in the United States and student loans have become per a pervasive means of financing higher education. This saddles generations of young people, about 46 million people with this $1.7 trillion in student loan debt, an average of $38,000 per student borrower. Over the long term, we believe in an approach it, that minimizes private debt, which targets the root causes of debt accumulation. To minimize student loan debt, we must make higher education tuition free. To eliminate medical debt, we must win the fight for free public health care. To minimize credit card debt, we must ensure decent paying, dignified jobs that are available to all with the federal job guarantee, which would uh, increase wages across the pay scale. And so in our, in our culture and public discourse, there is a strain of thought which holds that those who borrow should be made to pay off their debts and anything less than that accounts for some kind of injustice if not against the lender then against other borrowers in society who did repay their loans and so our campaign really seeks to to educate people about the mechanics of modern money and our campaign is really informed by the work of dr michael hudson whose research into the archaeological record of the ancient Jubilee tradition um, 
underscores that debt forgiveness was really a fundamental principle in the Abrahamic religions of the world, in particular Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Dr. Hudson points to Leviticus 25 and the Isaiah scroll as evidence of a longstanding tradition of the Jubilee year in biblical times. It's one that in Christianity, um, Jesus ascribes to and stands upon in Luke chapter four. And Dr. Hudson also points to the Assyriological consensus that the correct translation of the Lord's prayer is not forgive us our sins, but forgive us our debts. Very important. And so today, like in biblical times, we live in a society dominated by a creditor class. And today, nearly all of student debt is owed to the government. And the president, Joe Biden, could cancel nearly all of that student loan debt with the stroke of a pen. Um, um, and, and we're really calling for that. And so the major religions of the world, we believe, provide the kind a theological basis for this movement and campaign uh, to abolish student loan debt and more broadly the change in which we do fiscal policy. We're calling upon faith leaders and activists and or civil rights leaders who are sort of rooted in a kind of faith tradition to really understand this stream of theological and philosophical thought as uh, to inform their uh, civil rights work. Today, predatory lending practices allow lenders to lend at exorbitant high interest rates. And the major religions of the world speak against usury, which, which for me is more than just um, um, the charging of excessive interest. The definition of usury as lending at unreasonably high interest rates was a very late concession made by the church to the creditor class to change the church's position on usury as sin. And so all of our major tradition, tra tra traditions, Christianity, Islam, uh, Judaism, even Hinduism and Buddhism regarded the unjust manipulation of money uh, as immoral. And so I'm really delighted to join this conversation today. Thank you for allowing me to share. And I look forward to joining all of you in this movement uh, towards uh, cancellation of student debt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Coates. That was really great. Um, Hannah Judson um, will now be presenting. Hannah, are your slides ready now? Uh, I sure hope so. Um, <laughs> we will see. Let's see here. Hi, Garlic. Okay, let me do this. If I share this, is everyone able to see this time? It is loading, but if your slides um, aren't able to load, I have them pulled up and that might work. Okay. Gosh darn it. Because it says that it's like it says it's happy happily loaded for me now oh good glad to know that my audio is fixed and it looks mm -hmm. like they're just not loading i can go ahead and share my screen and then you can just tell me when to um when to switch the slides you guys can hear yeah, the background Just a minute here. No worries. I apologize. I don't know everything worked in the tab up beforehand, so I'm not sure why it decided to be great right. about it email, but it is what it is. Okay. Can everybody see that? Still loading for me. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't either. That is so weird. It's loading on my end too. Hannah, can Perfect. you give your presentation without the slides or are they? Um... Um, I can, I will start and while I'm going through it, uh, I will upload it to the big blue button thing and go through that way. It's fine. Okay. Um, all right. Anyways, 
as um, Grace mentioned earlier, hi everyone, I'm Hannah, um, talking about um, student loan debt, the racial wealth gap, what that looks like, um, and how all of these things tie together, intergenerational wealth transfer is kind of the main um, component here. Grace, I'm going to pull it up and I'll just let it load and maybe it will eventually load for everyone. And if okay. that's the case, great. And if not, it will be what it is. All right. Perfect. So I also unfortunately missed a little bit of Dr. Coates' presentation while I was freaking out. So um, I'm sad about that and we'll have to catch up with the recording that we post afterwards. But Slides essentially- are working now. Yes. Oh, it is? Yes. Yes. Yes, yay, finally, okay. So here's our, you know, our current <laughs> outstanding student loan debt. And um, this is just the stuff that is held federally. So um, this $1.6 trillion of student loan debt uh, does not include privately held student loans, of which there are many, right? So that's, you know, one facet of the problem here. Another piece of the puzzle that we're looking at is the fact that um, buying a home or a home is becoming uh, increasingly out of reach for uh, many people, but specifically people, you know, under 40 for the most part. Um, the millennials, uh, Gen Zers, um, who are starting to age into the uh, old enough to buy a home range, terrifyingly, um, are you know increasingly unable to buy a home uh, for a myriad of reasons, which we will talk about a little bit. Um, and so conceptually, this is what we're looking at, right? So homeownership is one of the, like the literature established, homeownership is one of the key components intergenerational wealth transfer um, and is a key piece to the racial wealth as well. White families were able to buy homes, were able to gain equity, pass that wealth on to their kids and start the snowball rolling. Um, whereas, you know, if we go all the way back in, in United States history to uh, Lincoln uh, promising 40 acres and a mule to newly freed slaves who didn't end up getting that, you know, literally, um, you know, start square one, um, black families have been at a disadvantage in terms of being able to buy homes, build equity and and pass that on generationally. Right. We also now have uh, the student loan debt crisis, as some are calling it, um, which both impacts intergenerational wealth transfer directly, i.e., Student loan debts don't get canceled when you die. They get passed on to uh, next of kin. If that's, you know, kids, uh, your kids will have student loans. Um, but also indirectly impacts this process by impacting hardship outcomes, right? Um, a lot of people have a mortgage's worth of student loan debts. Why would you take out a mortgage when you already have that much debt? Uh, already from, you know, student loans, right? So this is kind of the, the process that we're looking at. Um, and I specifically am looking at uh, what happened under complete student debt cancellation. So um, I'm using the Survey of Consumer Finances 2019. Uh, if anyone is familiar with Marshall Steinbaum's 2019 paper on debt cancellation, some of this will seem familiar to me. A very similar analysis, but with the most recent iteration of the survey data. Um, so I, Marshall, was not able to be here this evening, um, but I want to extend a huge thank you to him um, for his help directly and indirectly in putting this analysis together. So firstly, um, just looking at uh, the net worth of families. Um, this I constructed net worth variable and mapped basically what the white family's net worth looks like and the black family's net worth looks like as things stand right now. So before any 
cancellation at all, what's sort of our starting point here? And this is a graph of population share. So the farther um, over you are, excuse me, you can see essentially the white families in red are shifted down into the right, indicating that a larger proportion of the population um, exists at that wealth level, which is higher as you go right. And this is transformed on, it's not quite a logarithmic scale, but I had to do wonky, <laughs> wonkiness. I apologize, it's cat dinner time, so um, theaters are going off. Um, but I had to do some rescaling to my variables to make them actually fit on this graph. So, um, and essentially what we're seeing here is the space between the two lines is the quantity of the racial wealth gap uh, as it exists, right? Okay, so we know that this is, we know that white families have on average a higher net worth. We know that there's a racial wealth gap. What happens when you cancel all student loan debt? So just like point blank, all of it, cancel it. And that's what this looks like. So once student debt is canceled, you can see not only does everyone shift down into the right, so pushing more people towards a positive net worth, but additionally, the, the, the gap between white families and black families, while not eliminated, there's a lot of reasons that that gap exists, um, but it does narrow significantly, right? So, you know, if we overlay them on, on top of one another, you can see here, um, you can see the gap is shrinking, right? So essentially what this leads us to, what this can lead us to is that, um, complete student loan debt cancellation is a racially egalitarian policy proposal, right? This is something that we can realistically, you know, do and would have a real impact on um, the gap between, you know, the net worth of white families and black families. In the interest of time, because of tech issues, etc., I'm going to skip through, I'm going to speed through some of this. So, Essentially, I then also looked at the impact of these things on home ownership. So model one is looking is a logistic regression, um, and it's just looking at uh, the impact of all of these various um, factors on whether or not you own a home. Um, and I've got some graphs that summarize it more nicely, but that model two is then an OLS regression on the value of your home once you own it, right? So what we are seeing here is that the value of student loan debt, the amount of student loan debt that you have is significantly, uh, can significantly predict your probability of owning a home. And interestingly, depending on race, has differential effects, right? So we've controlled for the fact that student loan debt is taken on uh, differently by race, right? Like we know that white people end up taking on less student loan debt than black people across the board. So we control for that. And so we're looking at purely the effect of student loan debt value. Um, and for white people, the more student loan debt you have, you become slightly likely to own a home, whereas, you know, in the reverse, the more student loan debt that you have as a black family, uh, the more likely you are to own a home. And there's, um, I, I can't give you a solid explanation for why that is, but we can imagine there's something to do with, like, credential and education and sort of jobs that come, you know, post, uh, education may perhaps education is some kind of equalizing effect uh for black families um but there would have to be further sort of like probes to figure out what that is and we see the same relationship uh albeit a little bit more dramatically in home value so again here we're just seeing that for white families an increase in student loan debt leads to a decrease in home value on average, uh, everything else held equal, and the exact opposite for Black families, right? The An increase in student loan debt also increases the value of your home uh, or the probability of owning a more valuable home, right? So what does this mean? Why does any of this matter? Well, first of all, uh, 
we've seen that rate, you know, student loan debt cancellation entirely is a racially egalitarian policy proposal, right? Um, that does not uh, stop the headlines. And I apologize, I made this uh, presentation before today's announcement of um, the debt cancellation or some debt forgiveness from the Biden administration. Um, but, you know, there's lots of places that are, you know, fighting about, oh, no, like canceling student debt is going to cause inflation, you know, the whole um, sort of general scaremongering about what debt cancellation actually does. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we also see that, like, there's lots of stuff happening in the home market. Um, Black home ownership rates are still lagging behind home ownership rates, uh, and in fact are even lower than they were 10 years ago. The pandemic induced housing market frenzy is making it, you know, that much harder to buy a home um, in a market where first time home buyers are the primary home buyers. And so if we want to create an environment where people are actually able to do things like buy a home that they can use to build wealth and pass that on, you know, something like debt cancellation, while yes, it will have the immediate impact of narrowing the, the wealth gap, will over time end up, you know, exponentially decreasing this as people are able to, you know, do things like buy houses, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, thank you for your time today, and I look forward to a conversation. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, next, we have Luke Heron presenting. Hi. All thank right. you. And you can go ahead and take it away. Sure. Um, well, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Coates, and, and thank you. Hannah, for your wonderful presentations, for setting up this uh, very important conversation. Um, so I was invited today to talk about the legal aspects of student debt cancellation in particular. Um, and so I'll start with that, but I also want to sort of use the legal aspects of student debt cancellation as a way to reflect more broadly on the role of law in advocacy for debt cancellation and the role of debt cancellation um, in a broader program of um, uh, of the sort of investment-based politics that Dr. Coates was talking about. Um, so, uh, you know, Dr. Coates and I think uh, Hannah more indirectly take for granted that, you know, Biden can cancel student debt with the stroke of a pen. Um, but that was not the case um, five years ago even um, because nobody had even thought that was a possibility. Um, what happened was, uh, working with some other uh, folks in the legal space, I came up with a legal argument that that basically said, you know, the student debt can be canceled under existing legal authorities. And um, to me, the, it, the thing I want to talk about about that fact is that um, just making that legal case, making that legal point opens up political space, opened up a little political space such that we can have a conversation about the justice of student debt, about the value of canceling student debt um, in a way that would have been harder and indeed was actively being repressed um, in a world in which it seemed like any, doing anything about student debt required congressional action um, in a world where we know Congress is not really interested in doing anything uh, except for, as Dr. Cutt says, um, funding wars abroad. Um, and so this is a way of thinking about using legal advocacy, using legal theories, not necessarily to press a case in front of a court, although there, there could be a role there, but um, as a way of opening up imagination and creating space for organizing possibilities. Um, and so I want to sort of situate where that legal argument came from within an, a, a history of organizing to be able to, to, to sort of flesh that idea out a little bit more. Um, so actually the argument that um, the president can cancel student debt or the secretary of education can cancel student debt with the stroke of a pen um, is a, a 
sort of a sequel to an earlier argument that I developed with folks at the Debt Collective, which is an organization that that organizes debtors that I um, helped to create. Um, at, that argued that, and the, that argument was um, the Department of Education had the authority to, or not, didn't actually didn't have the authority, but had to um, cancel the debt of students who were defrauded by the schools that they attended. Um, so that's called the Borrower Defense Authority. And um, so this was about uh, well seven years ago at this point. Um, we uh, organized a bunch of for-profit college students to um, demand to have their debts canceled. And organizing that campaign was made much easier by being able to point to a provision of the Higher Education Act, which governs student loans owed to the federal government, and to be able to say, hey, the Higher Education Act says we have a defense to repaying our student loans um, if, you know, basically they violated state law, but basically if they lied to us, if they defrauded us. And that was an authority that was known and among specialists known to exist, but everyone thought, you know, the Department of Education couldn't do anything, wasn't going to do anything about it, and nobody else could do anything about it. So um, pointing to the legal authority was a way to empower for-profit college students to be able to assert their claim, to, to make a legal argument that was also a moral argument about whether they ought to pay this debt that you know, everyone says you should always pay. Um, if it's a debt, it's something that has to be paid. Everyone knows that. Um, this was a way of cutting through that and saying, no, actually, there's something in existing law that says you don't actually always have to pay your debt. Um, and it also, you know, but but that legal authority rate had existed out there, had been pressed by legal advocates, but by um, use, by bringing an organizing component into it, we forced the Department of Education to start to pay attention to this authority for the first time. Um, and I can talk more about that organizing campaign another time, but I just want to sort of point to the way that organizing and a legal argument can come together to open up space, political space, that also opens up space for making certain types of moral arguments that couldn't have been made before. So in the case of for-profit college students, we're talking about the nature of the legal claim is, look, the school wronged us, and therefore we shouldn't have to pay the debt, right? But one um, the way we made that argument was, first of all, there is a collective wrong done, right? This is an individual wrong. You have to prove fraud to each individual person who attended the school, which is how the Department of Education wanted to handle it initially. Rather, there's a collective wrong. And furthermore, the, the sort of organizing message and the um, power building language that we use within the campaign was always about, you know, student debt is actually always fundamentally wrong. Um, but this is a, a, a dish, this is something that's in the law that provides you a reason to say you shouldn't have to pay this debt. And um, we're fighting for every, we're fighting not just for us, right, but for other people who are in similar situations and even more broadly who have any sort of student debt at all. So um, it was a way to open up space, political space, um, in a way that you can't just sort of point to the nature of the legal authority and say, hey, there's a little, this is, uh, sort of a technical legal fix. If you bring it into an organizing context, um, opening up a little space can then allow you to open up more space. And so um, through that campaign, um, I discovered this other authority in the Higher Education Act called the Compromise Authority that basically says the Secretary of Education has the ability to settle or compromise claims um, that are owed to the Department of Education. Um, and the short version of the argument about why that allows him to cancel student debt is there's just nothing limiting that authority. So if he has the discretionary, or in this case, he has the discretionary authority to say, hey, I don't, you know, I'm gonna lessen the amount that you owe, and there's no thing that he has to consider in order to make that decision, he can just do it broadly, you know, for everyone. Um, and uh, so first of all, the very discover, the very sort of, legal interpretation itself comes out of organizing, right, is a downstream effect of this organizing. And also, um, then there's a sort of uh, ratcheting effect. You know, I discovered the authority, I wrote up a, an article about it. I, you know, through various uh, channels, it comes to the attention of Elizabeth Warren, who then runs a presidential campaign and puts it on her platform. And now suddenly, you know, Chuck Schumer <laughs> is in the Senate talking about how the president needs to cancel student debt. Uh, Chuck Schumer, like the senator from finance capital of the world, is talking about this, right? So, um, so there's a 
And, and Chuck Schumer can talk about it because it means he doesn't have to do anything about it, right? He just has to say, you know, the president should do this. So, so there's this unpredictable ways in which just pointing to a legal authority um, opens up space to be able to talk more broadly about the value of student debt cancellation. And, and I think this can be done um, more broadly. And in fact, I know it can be done more broadly because debt collector folks, um, there are other lawyers who are working with the debt collector who are working on similar sets of arguments for um, criminal justice fines and fees. Um, for instance, the debt collective now has a tool to allow people to dispute their debts, um, their, their bail debts um, using a novel legal theory. Um, uh, there's there's some a few things in the work about medical debt. Um, so there there's, and one of the reasons that creative legal work in this space can be effective is that it's a, it's a space where actually a lot of legal authorities haven't been settled in a lot of detail because of course, legal authorities are always, if you're a lawyer, you know, legal authorities are always kind of a little bit, you know, you can wiggle around. Um, but the people who get to do the wiggling around under the existing system are creditors, right? Debtors don't show up to court. And so actually what often happens is that the legal authority is not actually fleshed out in much detail. It's just sort of everyone assumes it works one way and they don't read it that much, right? But if you bring a collectivity of debtors to say, hey, we read it, right? And you owe us this. It's the, first of all, it can just be the first time that anybody has asserted that sort of claim. And if you have a good legal argument, it can open up space for organizing. And I think this can happen in a whole lot of different places in the debt space because of the sort of way that debt interacts with power, um, where the way that law interacts with power within, um, within debt uh, spaces. So I was going to say, maybe I should stop there um, and we can, we can have a further conversation, but I guess I would just want to say very briefly, um, you know, the reason Debt Collective got into organizing debtors in the first place and doing all this stuff that I'm talking about with the interaction with law and organizing is that we thought that organizing debtors was one, a way to politicize. So, you know, MMT folks always say, you know, everyone's debt is somebody else's asset, right? So to politicize that, right? Your debt is owned by somebody, um, demand something of them, right? And also they expect a certain percentage of you not to pay. So like, take that seriously that you're not, you don't have to pay the exact amount that you're owed, that you are said to be owed, right? Um, and the other aspect of that is that the reason, as Dr. Coates said very elegantly, the reason that people are in debt is because of public underprovision. And so in the, in the student debt space, this is very directly clear because the debt is owed to the federal government. And it's basically the government saying, we're not gonna pay the full amount, we're gonna charge you. Right, we're going to basically tax you through this back, this sort of back-ended way. Um, but it's more indirectly true in other spaces too. I mean, it's it's quite easy to see in the in the healthcare space as well. And so, organizing around debt and organize, making these sort of careful legal arguments to argue for debt cancellation is also a way to open up space to talk about the necessity of public provision. Where does this debt come from? Who, what do we actually owe to each other? Um, so that I think is dire fits directly within a politics of um, rechanneling public money uh, for the, you know, a politics of investment, as I would call it. Um, and, you know, debtors are a natural base for that sort of politics. So it, it provides an organizing uh, hook, as it were, for an MMT type of politics. Okay, I'll stop there. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat. So first for Dr. Coates, um, Jeff wants to know if you can review uh, regarding what you learned from Michael Hudson about what's said in church. Um, and he says his memory as an outsider is forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Um, and the original text is forgive us our debts. Are you aware of why, how, um, and when this changed? Oh, you are muted, Dr. Coates. Okay. There you go. Thank you. So thanks, Jeff, uh, for the question. Um, this isn't a part of my academic training. Certainly, I am aware of this tradition um, uh, where the Lord's Prayer is translated Forgive us our debts. I believe the beginning of this happens in the 16th century with William Tyndale's English translation of uh, the Bible, where forgive us our debts becomes trespasses. What I think is interesting about this, and 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 I don't know if um, folks have done work 
on this, but this is happening right around the same time that concessions are being made to change in the church to change the way the church regarded usury as sin. So uh, uh, Jeremy Bentham is really um, around this time um, on behalf of the creditor class, banker class, trying to get the cap the church leaders to redefine usury. And what happens is, as I understand it, is that usury begins usury begins to be defined as the charging of excessive interest. Prior to that, it was the charging of any interest was sin. The charging of any interest was sin. And this is because in the Christian tradition, they're largely drawing, and particularly around the medieval period, they're drawing on the insights of, of Aristotle, his view of usury, where he talks about the trade of the petty usurer is hated with the most reason. It makes a profit from currency itself. And I, I actually was going to ask a question after listening to Luke. And so the question from Jeff makes me think about this. So Aristotle talks about profiting from currency itself, then led uh, Thomas Aquinas, who was a father of Roman Catholic theology and a student of Aristotle, to say the following. He says, to take usury for money lent is unjust in itself because this is to sell what does not exist. And this evidently leads to inequality, which is contrary to justice. So in the Aristotelian tradition, which largely informed Christian medieval theology, the notion that money could beget itself was a major theological, philosophical, and economic problem. The view was cattle can you know, beget itself, you know, uh, you know, cattle, they can bear another cattle, you know, the animals, but the notion that money should be able to reproduce itself just by its very nature was regarded in Arist Aristotelian philosophy as uh, immoral and that it caused injustice. And the Catholic church stood on that position for a long time until around the 15th, 16th century which is when concessions from the from the creditor class, the banker class is beginning to get concessions from the church around its definition of usury, which was more than just the charging of excessive interest. It was really like forcing people to go into debt, period. So I would say Tyndall, Tyndall's, William Tyndall's English translation from forgive us our debts, to forgive us our trespasses is happening around this same time and could quite possibly be influenced by the victories that the creditor class is having on the church's understanding of you, a fundamental understanding and foundational understanding of usury as sin. It is really the it is really in Islam that has really, I would say, continues to be the standard bearer in the Abrahamic religious tradition of defining usury or riba in Arabic uh, as, you know, immoral or as sin. So that's the only thing I could say. My understanding is that William Tyndale is a tr is is, you know, is responsible for this. Trend, this change in translation, which is happening in the 1500s, which is around the time the church is beginning to shift its position on usury. That said, I was going to I was going to sort of ask my own question, if I may. <laughs> um, you know, Luke, do you think that re and, and perhaps, you know, Hannah as well, when one thinks about the mechanics of modern money. Um, do you think it would be helpful? And, and by that, I mean, what we are calling a loan is really not a loan. 
you know, um, when you think of a loan, you think of an in individual or an entity having to have the money first in order to quote unquote, lend it to someone else. And so what I have found is that when we have done training sessions uh, on the mechanics of modern money, the mechanics of money creation, the mechanics of bank money creation, I believe we have 10 educational animated videos on the Our Money Campaign website. It forces people to, to really reframe what we're calling a loan. And so I wonder if, you know, if we begin to reframe what banks are doing, might that help build support for the public? And for perhaps policymakers to begin thinking about to to change the way uh, uh, we think about whether it's possible to abolish student loan debt and holding people accountable to pay back. Pe when when people realize that what they receive was not really fundamentally a loan, but money created out of nothing, then maybe we should reframe the loan, reframe the student loan. Um, um, and I was just wondering whether you all think, you know, that could help in building public support for this movement to abolish student loan debt. Um, Dr. Coates, I think that's a really provocative and generative question. I, I you know, my uh, first draft of an answer, I mean, so I guess I would say, first of all, I'm not sure. I, I, it's necessarily the case that because money is created in order to create a, you know, make a loan that it's not a loan in a sense. I mean, it's not a loan in the sense that it's not a pre-existing sort of thing here that is then given to somebody, but, but, you know, you can lend something that you create out of nothing because you just give it to somebody on the condition that it, you know, it, it comes back to you. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I do think that um, even just, so, uh, you know, one of the ways that I've phrased it recently is to think about um, loans as investments, right? Loans are investments, but like conditional on repayment. And um, I think student debt is actually a way to get at, um, to tease out one aspect of like, bank, of like the way credit usually works. Um, to separate it from the other aspect. And that is to say that like, you know, student debt is given by the government on condition that it be paid back, right? But which is, but so it's not given, um, there's no underwriting required, right? And it's not given in order to make a profit, right? Although of course the government does make a profit, but it's actually not really like the, the program is not run to make a profit per se. Um, although it is, it does, you know, the revenue it gets allows it to allows the government to play all these budget games. And, you know, you know, we know the games that they play with the budget. Um, but but so so that's one that allows us to separate out that one aspect of giving of investing in somebody conditional on repayment, which is, you know, often that's done investing somebody condition conditional on ability to repay. Right. Which means sorting people by already existing resources. Right. Um, that's not done with student debt. And yet there's this additional aspect of it, which is investing somebody conditional that they pay it back. Right. Mm -hmm. um, with all these, you know, uh, in the case of the student loan program, complicated conditionals on that as well. And I think um, so. And then that allows us to say, well, why should we have to pay it back? Right. It, you already invested in this. Right. The, the, th the, the thing that was invested in exists. I got the benefit. Actually, there's a societal benefit. Now we can have a discussion about like, hey, why, like, what's the purpose of this? If I'm paying it back, if it's basically a tax, like now let's talk about tax policy, right? It sort of shifts the discussion. So anyway, um, that's a lot, but I think the sort of initial move is the way I'd like to think about it is to talk about loans as investments. And it allows us to think about them as on a par with other ways of investing, right? You're investing in somebody. Well, on what terms should we invest in, invest in people? Should it only be if they can pay the money back, right? Maybe that makes sense for businesses, maybe, right? Maybe. But with respect to individuals, I think that there's a lot more moral intuition against that. If the thank you for that, Lou. And and I'll if if the same monetary mechanism that went into creating educational grants 
is the same monetary mechanism that goes into creating educational loans. What I'm saying is, well, what if we just start saying it's a grant, it's a loan, it's never, it's not a loan, it's a grant. I mean, I'm dating myself when I say that this, but when I started college, grants were the thing that was that were that were available for people, you know, in I'm not gonna say when I went to college, but when I was going to college, that was a big thing. So I'm you know, and it's it's been since the early nineties that there's been a shift from thinking about um this broad pool of public money that we called grants and the mechanisms I believe for the monetary mechanisms for creating what you're, you know, this, the, the government loan or the, or the student loans is the same monetary, it's the same mechanism. So what if we start saying, you know what, the bank really didn't loan us any money. They, I mean, the, the government or the bank, whatever, they, they grant, they created the money. It was, it's not a loan. It's a grant. I'm just curious. Right. Now they're what trying what to tax it back. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, just, yeah. I guess what I would say, well, sorry, Hannah, you go ahead. No, I, I guess what I was going to say, you know, so one interesting thing that's happened with a student loan program is that, is that, the, you know, um, for decades, economists had sort of argued, look, student loans, that's great. You know, it allows people to invest in their human capital and their, you know, employability. And it's always a positive investment, basically always, right? And and, th and the, that defense has sort of been whittled away over time as they see, well, okay, actually the investment doesn't work out for a lot of people. Actually, the amount that people spent, you know, it's like the, the amount of debt is starting to catch up to the amount of like benefit that you, you know, monetary benefit that you get from a student um, loan. And so, and all of these conditional programs and come-based repayment. So now the, sh the sort of terrain has shifted to a lot of economists, a lot of the people who support student loans say, hey, you know, Yes, the current system, nobody can defend that, right? But student loans are great as long as they're income-based repayment, right? Because then it's progressive. But then, but, and, and now really the people who have said that have realized what they're saying is we need, it's like a tax, right? Because actually we shouldn't have to make people pay, you know, we shouldn't have to pay, garnish their wages and make it conditional, just make it automatic deduction, right? Okay, now this is a tax, right? And so it's like the, the line is like, it's not, there anymore and now it's like well okay why are we taxing people for getting an education like why is that the instance of tax right and then you get to like this this question and it doesn't have to do now we're not talking about like should you pay your debt or you know because it's like actually the amount is totally conditional on the income and all that stuff so i don't know if that's helpful at all but i do think that is a that it, like the, the discourse has moved in that direction um gradually over time thank you anna you were gonna i don't know um, uh, I will also just say that I think in terms of the discourse that Luke was talking about, there are a lot of efforts to stop the entire conversation and just say, well, higher education should be free, right? Like federal government, instead of in loans to borrowers that they then have to pay back interest, the federal government should just be uh, paying for the education, you know, right off the bat, and we shouldn't have these loans anyways. Um, but I think that that misses a crucial component, which Sherry, I think, uh, asked a question that's related, um, which is that the cost of tuition is not the only cost that student loans are A full-time student is full-time reason. And you spend the amount of time that they would spend at a full-time job being a student, and so they still need to be able to pay subscription and all of these other things that uh students pay for right and so i think that dr coates your reframing of grants uh makes a lot of sense because even in a world where you know higher education is free we should still be giving people grants so that they can afford to to live to while they're in school right no one's gonna it it's great if higher education is free but if people still need to make rent every month uh, they don't, they're not going to have time to do it, right? So um, I appreciate, I think, uh, I think you're right on the nose there with um, the the reframing of loan as grant. I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you guys for answering that. Um, we don't have a ton of time left, but I would love if the panel um, could answer this question. And someone asked if the panel could comment on the organizing role of the MMT perspective of student debt as a federal tax. I mean, you guys briefly touched on that, but if there's any anything else you wanted to add to that. Well, sorry, Dr. Coates. Would no, 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 please. please. I'm, I'm I, um, I guess one other thing that I wanted to, this is not directly responsive, but one other thing I wanted to note is that there is, there is, so there is, there are a number of ways that the student debt program now doesn't really operate like a tax that are not like in this domain of like the logical, like, you know, does the money come out and when does it come back in and all what can do, right? It's more like, um, the, the way the funding happens is you have to like, you have to fill out a FAFSA form. And so, you know, um, colleges have to develop student, student aid departments and they have to be highly sophisticated in how they like manage all the grants and, right, because they know that like some of it's gonna come from the government, some of it's gonna be a grant. They're gonna have to have a certain number of scholarships and they have to navigate. and um, and you know, I'm alighting a lot of stuff here, but what that does is actually shifts how colleges are governed, right? The fact of providing funding on certain conditions um, means that basically colleges themselves become financialized. Like the people who are selected to run the colleges are people who have to understand how to cultivate donors, how to um, figure out a sophisticated way to get funding, you know, to, to navigate the rankings, um, which, is somewhat about right, loans, but but it's it's about other things too. But but these are all sort of downstream effects of funding something through debt that is not like you know due to the the sort of definitional nature of whether somebody has to pay it back or not. Um, um, and I think that's that's really important to emphasize. Like if we just if we directly funded public universities, right? Rather than this is also a difference between grants, right? Rather than giving money to students to take wherever they want. And then there has to be competition for students and all these different, right, and competition for status. If we say, look, you know, money goes to public colleges, here are the conditions on which you must accept people, right? You can have, you can have some, have a whole bunch of conditions on like how to think about the proper, you know, selectivity versus non-selectivity for different disciplines and the like. But the point is that that's a much more sort of public vision of what higher education is. Um, uh, that is downstream from how it's funded, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think the question was about was it was also an organization. There was also an organizational component to the to the question, and so what I would um, sort of say beyond that, I think connecting the whole question of public support for college education with um, and I sort of see, you know, um, comments in the comments section in the chat, connecting it with, you know, a kind of broader mission oriented approach to how we think about public spending and in particular a federal job guarantee, because that could that could help to inform. Right. If, if we sort of imagining, you know, the kind of productive output we need in our economy, the kind of jobs that are necessary. Um, and, um, you know, we, we obviously need a trained and educated, you know, workforce to fulfill these jobs. You know, if, you know, by connecting the college education piece to something, you know, broader than that, look, I want to tell you guys, I'm not an economist. I'm a black bastard, you know, but I'm, I'm I, I think that it's critically important for us to connect, you know, uh, to, to connect the, the student, the college education piece. And we, we believe we should have free public, you know, education, connecting it with something broader, like a federal job guarantee sort of connects, connects all of these issues, right? And building momentum and organizing uh, around that, um, you know, I, and I, I believe can really help to um, to to build momentum for uh, abolition of student loan debt, free public college, and a federal job guarantee, and kind of connecting them 
uh, in some meaning, meaningful ways and get more and more Americans on board with this critically important issue. I also think in relation to the point of like time this to sort of a broader framework and Luke's comments about um, the way that we fund higher education has implications for a lot of things along the way. I think jointly with all of this, beginning to imagine higher education as a public good as opposed to a private investment while I think to a lot of MMTers, this seems like a very like, duh, of course, obvious kind of concept. That's not necessarily what the, you know, the general public's perception of higher education is, right? Like, because of the way that colleges have been funded through loans for the last however many years, um, higher education in the public imagination exists as a uh, you know, as a private investment, that it's going to college is something that you do to, you know, ad add to your human capital, right, to become a better worker, to make more money, whatever, but it's, you know, a very individualized thing. If we can shift the framing away from sort of like human capital, individualist investment type things towards something like you know, our entire society does better when people are educated, right? Like, we have stronger democracy, we, you know, we can pursue knowledge for the sake of knowledge itself. And, you know, that's an okay and, you know, thing to do and we should be doing. Um, and all that becomes how we run higher education. And so I think, uh, it might have been Pody in the chat who was talking about how he refers to instead of um, loans as a loan or as a tax, I think that, you know, while yes, it uh, like can be useful because it's like very drastic, you know, like, like emphatic emotional language. I also think that, you know, envisioning the world that we want to be in where higher education is a public good and you know grants become grants and they aren't you know a punishment um i think that has just as much power and organizing potential uh as you know sort of pointing out where we are right now and and sort of like people know that their loans are a punishment right they're not like maybe they haven't connected the legal concepts necessarily but you know they're aware of of that uh at least emotionally right so um, moving beyond and looking forward to to where we want to be i think um and having uh, a broad organizing application as well mm -hmm. can i just briefly piggyback oh, i'm sorry oh no go ahead i i um i guess i wanted to piggyback briefly to say that you know i think it's the, our, a vision of, you know, I don't know how much we want to get down to higher education in particular uh, line, but a vision of, of higher education as a public good, I think, means more than just educating people. You know, colleges are institutions that provide services to communities and um, ought to provide more services to communities. And I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to, uh, this is a, a hobby horse of mine that I'm going to bring out. Like, I think um, a vision of public investment should be a vision that focuses on anchor institutions through which investment is channeled. And I think universities are a great place. Universities are places with hospitals, with free legal clinics, with art, with museums, with concerts, with sports events, you know, et cetera. I mean, we, we sports events are well invested in, right? We don't need to invest further in sports events. But, but um, these are spaces of, you know, public enjoyment and service, right? And, and could be made you know, colleges could be required to make them more open to the public, right, and more free and make, you know, education a more ongoing thing and also make universities more of a space for, you know, free medical clinics and more expansive free legal clinics. Um, uh, you know, a space for like training teachers who teach in the community. I mean, you, you can think about like the sort of knock on investments that can come through a university. Um, and I think that sort of expansive notion of what a public, like a truly public vision for um, university is is uh, something that is worth fleshing out. 
also, I'm going to piggyback on that really quickly. Sorry, Grace, we're not giving you an easy job for moderating tonight. But um, Luke, your comments remind me of what the public provisioning panel spoke about last week and tying, uh, you know, public higher education into something like a jobs guarantee, you know, makes a lot of sense, both in, um, as Betty and Sherry pointed out in the chat, right, like, your job in a jobs guarantee can be to be a student like that's perfectly reasonable but also in the way that um i believe it, it might have been jordan last week said like uh the jobs guarantee is going to play out in communities right the needs of every community are unique and you can't just sort of uh say like oh well you know black folks as a monolith in the united states need x y and z so we're going to do this right like it's very dependent on where you are geographically what's going on you know in your specific community and so luke the vision you shared of like a truly public university makes me think of like yeah and also a center for organizing what needs to happen for something like a jobs guarantee in that community right really becoming like a central hub of, you know, information and resources. So, yes. Sorry, Grace. <laughs> no, thank you guys. That that was really insightful. Um, Peter wants to know, he says that Republicans are lying that student debt relief primarily helps the wealthy. What are the clearest statistics or points that we can um, cite to expose that lie? So I will say right off the bat, like, I don't have a nice, easy statistic um, that's easy to rattle off or, you know, post on Twitter in a flame war or something like that. But I will say um, trying to avoid like a broadly positivist kind of like, this is what's, you know, based on research and evidence, like, blah, blah, blah. like we, we know that that's not true. And we know that, you know, the distribution of loans taken out is skewed, right? It's skewed towards people of color. It's skewed towards low-income folks. Like, it doesn't make logical sense that, like, the people who have a lot of income are not the people taking out a lot of loans because they can just pay for the school, right? Like, they don't need to take out the loan in the first place. So why would loan cancellation be something that is, uh, you know, disproportionately beneficial to wealthy people. I will also say um, none of my research is like published yet, whatever that means, but uh, Marshall Steinbaum's paper uh, from 2019 is published and he does a very similar analysis. And um, that's one, that's a resource that I've used when talking to people about, you know, what loan cancellation looks like and what the actual practical effects of it are. Um, so well worth a, I, uh, I find that a lot of academic articles can be really wordy and inaccessible, but I think that this paper does a good job of being pretty plainly, um, you know, written and, and easy to digest um, and has a lot of really awesome information about like what the actual effects of, of debt cancellation would be. Um, and Marshall's paper is a little bit more nuanced in that it uh, looks at actual debt plans. So this was written in sort of the Warren Sanders fighting era. So he looks at where we, you know, where we were at the time, what something like Elizabeth Warren's platform would do, what something like complete cancellation would do as Bernie proposed, et cetera. So a little more nuanced and, and more information. So I hope that that's a helpful resource. Hannah, could you expand a little bit um, about the difference between what that complete cancellation would do uh, versus what like a partial cancellation would do? And we saw, you know, with the Biden administration putting out um, a proposed $10,000 cancellation, like your research on how uh, it affects the racial wealth gap. Did you Did you see anything about that in your research? Absolutely. So any kind of cancellation works to shrink the wealth gap, especially, you know, when we're thinking about the racial wealth gap. We know that the loans are, you know, people of color are more likely to take out 
more loans, they're likely to take out higher value loans, loans with higher interest rates, et cetera, for a myriad of reasons. Um, racism being the simplest uh, explanation for that. Um, and so any kind of cancellation policy works to close that gap. Um, obviously, the more you cancel, the more impactful it will be, right? So I looked, I looked specifically at complete cancellation. Um, unfortunately, my data didn't have the granularity to be able to distinguish between federally held debt and, and uh, privately held debt in terms of cancellation. Canceling federally held debt seems like an easier political obstacle to some. Uh, but, you know, thanks to MMT, we know that it, you know, would not be incredibly difficult for the federal uh, government to underwrite or to pay off sort of all of the student loan debt that exists, right? So, um, yeah, basically any cancellation helps shrink the gap, but if you want to make the maximum impact, you need to cancel the maximum debt. Thank you. Um, and then further expanding on that, does anyone on the panel have any just comments or reactions to the latest Biden policy that we've alluded to a couple times um, about the 10,000 of student debt? What were your initial reactions to that? I'd, I'd love to hear from the panel about that. I mean, I guess the easy thing to say is it's like obviously insufficient and sort of laughably it's like a parody of itself but i also think uh, maybe a less obvious thing to say is that you know if they indeed do it and if now it, now the door's open right <laughs> like it, you know we're going to see is there going to be a legal challenge what's the nature of the legal challenge going to be you know how is it going to play out i mean it could close a door because it's just it's so badly designed that everyone thinks like this is just you know, this is stupid and we should never do it again. But I think the positive of it is that it really does. It's like, okay, this is done once. Like, why is this the limit? There's nothing you, there's nothing that you said, except for like, you just decided that this was the limit, that this is the limit. Right. And so I think it does potentially open up space. I, I would, would, would add to this. Certainly we know it's insufficient, but I find that one of my greatest challenges with the range of policy proposals that we're supposed to be excited about is that when policymakers give us something with their with one hand but take it away with the other hand i find it difficult for me to celebrate so so i mean the best example i can think of is a jobs program we all know that we need job, you know, that the pub, that we need more jobs. But I find it difficult for me to celebrate, you know, policies where policymakers give us jobs with one hand, but they maintain the policy tools that enable them to take away jobs with the other. And so for me, when I think about this sort of piecemeal approach to the student loan uh debt issue um i sort of think about it in the same way kind of giving us giving us a giving us something on the one hand but maintaining um economic assumptions a commitment to like reduce the debt you know, i mean reduce the deficit as i heard the other other day in another uh discussion from the white house um, it just makes it difficult for me to 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 sort of, you know, to to sort of celebrate it. Um, um, and it and it actually causes me to be very concerned because what happens is. The public is given something and then they can and then policymakers and there's, you know, supporters can stand back and say, we gave you guys this. Why are you still like, you know, I don't know complaining about it or, you know, um, you know, why, had, you know, five years later, you know, why are you guys, why are the, you know, minority communities still, you know, still struggling, still in debt. And so I just find it hard for me to celebrate because it actually ends up getting used against you uh, down the road. And I, I really struggle with that kind of 
And I find that kind of approach and I find it really difficult for me to celebrate. So sorry. Um, I will echo everything that Luke and Dr. Coates have uh, said so far. I also will just for a point of reference for anyone following along who is fortunate enough to not have any student loans. Um, as of 2020, average federal student loan debt is $36,000 per borrower and private debt averages $50,000 a borrower. Um, and critically, uh, half of student loan debt uh, holders still owe $20,000 each on their outstanding balances 20 years after they take them out, right? So 20 years out of school, uh, the average 45, 50 year old, assuming people are going to school at the you know, 18 to 25 year range, still have $20,000 of student loan debt to pay down, right? So uh, yeah, again, the, the $10,000 rumored proposal is laughable. Um, yes, Sherry, this does. And uh, where I'm getting my information from is actually the Education Data Initiative. Um, I will post the link to their in the chat so that anyone else can uh, take a look. They did a report. Um, they break down loan debt by all kinds of factors like year, race, uh, gender, education level, institution type, etc. So if you're interested in looking into that with more granularity, that's the uh, link. And um, yeah, it's just ten thousand uh, dollars. Is, is nothing. And I, I mean, like I said earlier, something's better than nothing, right? Like it, it closes the gap a little bit in terms of looking at the racial wealth gap, but um, the, you know, to have maximum impact, you just need to have more, uh, more tech canceled. And I, I think that it's not for a lack of uh, political will. I mean, in terms of the American public, everyone has <laughs> loan debt. I don't, I can't think of a person that I talk to um, who doesn't have some kind of, of loan debt, educational or otherwise, right? And so um, it really is a matter of uh, some kind of accountability that policymakers need to face to their constituency when this um, cancellation is such a widely publicly supported policy, right? It becomes a matter of, okay, like, let's make it happen. Let's, <laughs> let's figure out. Um, you know, how do we make sure that, that our policymakers are, are listening to us? Um, but yes, thank you. Thanks so much, Hannah. Um, so in our last five minutes, um, it doesn't, I don't see the, the chat um, has dropped some awesome links and some resources to some different books on this. Um, so folks should feel free to check that out. Um, I was wondering if our panelists have any closing thoughts and then if you wanted to share any projects you're working on, um, any websites we should visit, any groups we should get involved in, um, I would love to hear about that and we can, we can put that in the chat so people can go and check that out afterwards. Uh, the Debt Collective is, you know, an open membership organization. Everyone should join. Um, you can do it if you want to, you know, refuse to pay your student debt or not. Um, there's plenty of other um, work to do and uh, uh, organizing to do and community to build. So um, the Debt Collective, debtcollective.org, I guess I should link to that. Luke, will you also link where we can find you online and um, your work more broadly? Dr. Coates has put the Our Money website. So yeah, I, I would I would just direct uh, folks to the People's Plan, which is our policy, public policy uh, framework that we've sort of put together. And um, we're organizing around this policy framework, which includes um, calling for debt cancellation. And um, we are encouraged 
that there are civil rights organizations and black religious denominations that have already approved this policy framework that includes the federal job guarantee, free public education, free public health care, um, uh, changing the way we think about um, our, our, our uh, public spending capacity. So the people's plan is something that we are continuing to work to get more and more black religious denominations and faith leaders to use as the base, their basis for public engagement with political parties and with candidates for office. And I'm hopeful um, that we'll get um, one or two national civil rights organizations to adopt the people's plan as a part of their policy framework uh, over the next year or so. So go to the Our Money website, ourmoneyus.org, scroll down to the people's plan and check that out. Well, I don't have um, a cool website to link, unfortunately. I will just link you to my Twitter if you want to find me there. Um, but I will also say, uh, if you're interested in learning more about debt cancellation and the MMT framework more broadly, uh, if someone, one of my esteemed colleagues from the Modern Money Network would drop the link in the chat to our onboarding form, become a member at MMN, the Modern Money Network, um, get plugged into uh, a local community, a bunch of other people who are in your region. We I think 60 different countries have MMN chapters at this point. So uh, get plugged in alternately. Uh, if you're just interested in topical stuff, come join people who are interested in that kind of stuff and learning more. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's all my plugs. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. This was wonderful. And um, like I said, there's a lot of awesome resources and links in the chat. Um, and this session will also be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel after the conference. And so feel free to share this with your friends or family. Um, this is a really insightful panel. Um, thank you all so much. And we hope to see you guys tomorrow for a conversation with Stephanie Kelton, which is our final event of the fourth conference. Thank you, Grace. Thank you for facilitation. Thanks, Dr. Coates and Thank Hannah. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, Thank thanks, you, everybody. everybody. Yeah. See you guys tomorrow.